I have to leave you with one disturbing image from this block, I would throw it's this. Remember guys, you need to ride the bear. You don't need to let the bear ride you. I use Thrum targets on the range for all the benefits of steel with none of the drawbacks. They're made in the USA too. Pick up a set to make your shooting more fun and effective. We're going to start talking about John's sacred cow slaughterhouse. Let's start looking at some of the stuff we've always been told that's probably wrong. We're going to be looking at the, uh, the, the scientific research that comes out of this environment, right? And straight off the bat, it's very hard to find stuff that directly applies to us. There's probably some good research and studies out in the Department of Defense world. They know how many reps and stuff like that. But that stuff is not open source that we can get to. So for instance, with this, I relied slightly on sports science, but a lot of this actually comes from the aviation communities because the aviation community is making split second decisions under extreme duress as well. But again, it's not the open source stuff isn't directed to us. Why is that? Well, probably because oppressing and killing the victims of our evil capitalist society really isn't a hot research topic on community campus. So what we end up doing a lot of times is taking research that is from similar situations and applying it to our realm. So somebody out there is doing extensive combative systems development on experiments they did with shocking a bunch of mice. The other thing we see with this is that a lot of the research is just old. The optimal performance stuff goes back to 1908. The starter response stuff started back in 1939, right? Uh, we very rarely cross test the crossover between our realm and, and uh, reality. And when it is tested, it often doesn't apply. So some years back, some college professors wanted to know if American police were inherently racist in their shoot, no shoot decisions. So what did they do? They got a bunch of Psych 101 students who got extra credit for participating in the lab to sit in front of a computer and make shoot or no shoot decisions. And they concluded that American police were racist. Later on down the road, when they recreate that experiment with American police officers who have actually had training, guess what they find? There's no relationship, right? You got to test the crossover. You know, you also have the problem with these damn ethics committees, the great studies where people thought they were shocking each other to death and stuff like that. Um, we can't do that anymore. Uh, supposedly, somebody was trying to do an experiment in which uh, they went to test prayer, right? They were going to pray for random people, but they couldn't get, con they would be required to get consent from the people that were being prayed for. And it's like, dude, you're not touching them, you're not doing anything, you're just having people pray for them. Like, you know, the ethics committees have gotten really, really tight with this research. Uh, some of the more interesting stuff because of these damn ethics committees, I'm going to talk some more about some work that's coming out of the military community that they're starting to publish, where they're not as worried about the ethics committees as the college university might be, right? It's also, I'd say it's been getting better as far as stuff applying into our world. In 2004, the Fletzi stress test study was published. Uh, it's the best boondoggle I've ever heard of. They had somebody, the Fed, Fletzi is the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. One of the guys on staff was working on his PhD in psych. And he conned Fletzi into letting him use the entire campus and all their infrastructure for his PhD dissertation. And it was the most complex thing I've ever heard about. They wanted to test uh, the recruits' ability to make decisions. So the way they, and they wanted to get them ramped up. So they actually, they put heart rate monitors on everybody. And they had a, a cohort. They thought it was another student, but it was actually an instructor from the driver marine division. And this guy would go out and almost intentionally wreck the car to get everybody really, really ramped up. Then they'd take them and do their scenario their scenario. It's just amazing what happens when you have unlimited funds, thank you taxpayers, which you can actually accomplish. But the Fletzi stress test study was the first one to kind of find that a lot of the stuff we had told about, for instance, heart rate, was not always the case. The other thing we tend to see is as new knowledge comes out, people don't update their old assumptions, right? People are still reading, sharpening the warrior's edge and assume nothing has changed. And again, we run into the problem with terms about, you know, uh, similar fields using the same words, but using them differently or multiple definitions of the same word, or different words to describe the phenomena. It kind of gets lost in the weeds there. Let's talk about one of my favorite myths to bust. Heart rate is king. Who's heard at some point that your, your heart rate may elevate during stressful situations and it'll affect your performance? Everybody's heard that one before, right? So back in 1908, this shocked some mice, right? And they shocked the mice at varying levels. They wanted to try to encourage them to get through the maze as quickly as possible. What they found was there was a sweet spot where the mice performed best. If they used too little electricity, the mice were simply not motivated and didn't perform well. If they used too much electricity, the mice just simply ended up demoralized, right? And didn't do very well on the maze either, right? Somebody laughing at something? Okay. <laughs> These uh, scientists were called Yerkes and Dodson. 
And this gave us the much vaunted Yerkes Dodson inverted U principle, right? This led to these optimal performance zones. Subsequent scientists studied the effects of performance at different arousal levels, including finding gross motor skills and decision making. Others monitored heart rate and track performance and motor tasks, and they found very distinct zones where performance increased or decreased based on the required skills. That was, of course, translated into these written in stone guides showing the effects of stress based on heart rate. Siddle and Sharpening the Warrior's Edge. A consistent theme in this text is the role heart rate has on combat performance, right? She quoted in the Sharpening the Warrior's Edge. What does Grossman do in all combat? All he does is go back and requote Siddle. But again, we get this written in stone condition where at this blood, you know, at this magic heart rate, you're going to do X, Y, or Z, right? So it seems like a pretty cool idea, except for one small point. It's wrong, okay? It's too neat and it's way too mechanistic. Uh, quoting Schmidt, the relationship between arousal, anxiety, and performance is much more complex. You will see me quote Schmidt a lot in this book. Uh, Dr. Richard Schmidt unfortunately passed away. I was fortunate I was corresponding with him right before he died. He was the motor learning guy. He wrote the graduate school textbook on motor control and learning. So anything you see from Schmidt is literally generally from the graduate school textbook on the subject, right? Realistically, these models have no consideration for whether somebody's untrained, adequately trained, or overlearned in the particular subject. I mentioned Futsi. Futsi was the first study that did not consistently show the decreased performance with increased heart rate that we had been told was going to happen all the time. Now, there's some alternative theories that I really like. You've got the zone of optimal functioning, right? Hannon found that optimal zones vary greatly based among the individual, the task, and the environment. This guy, I am convinced, was a not so closetist sadist, right? He was the guy that would take subjects and put them in a sauna and make it as hot as possible and have them perform tasks. He would like then put them in a meat locker and make them hypothermic and perform different tasks, right? You know, he just woke up and was like, how can I torture people today? And then went out and did it, right? But he found that the zones varied greatly. There wasn't one magical zone. It based on the person, what they were trying to do, as well as the environment in which they're doing it. Now, my personal favorite is catastrophe hypothesis, okay? Catastrophe hypothesis says that the change in performance does not follow that neat linear path. It says that performance collapse is sharp and abrupt when cognitive anxiety exceeds a certain level. What the hell does that sound like? That sounds very much like that transition from the rational mind to the emotional mind. When cognitive anxiety reaches that breaking point, I transition to the emotional mind and I don't perform as well. Now, it was a crazy idea for a study, but if we wanted to know how heart rate affected the performance of police officers, here's how, how's this for a crazy idea. How about we put heart rate monitors on cops? Ooh, might we learn something? Kathy Vonk did this in the early 2000s, okay? Put heart rate monitors on cops. She monitored cops both in the academy and in the field. I don't think she ever got an actual shooting, but she got everything else but shootings, pursuits, foot pursuits, knock down, drag out fights, stuff like this. She was able to collect data and she did it very, using very, very high quality heart rate monitors, like in the Fletzi study. Uh, it's kind of funny because I told you that the, uh, the person driving the car was actually a Confederate that was in one of the driving rain division instructors. I went through Fletzi in 02 and I could have been a, a subject in that study. None of the drivers or none of the instructors get to drive stock cars. So at the time, everybody wanted to drive the Caprice with the LT1 engine in it. Well, it wasn't just that. They had, a, really, they had the instructors had electronic tuning and they were all ready to go. They found that they couldn't get any data out of the cars because the electronic ignition in the cars were screwing with the heart rate monitors. What Vonk did is she used heart rate monitors that sampled several times a second. The Fletzi stuff did an averaging over a certain number of seconds, right? So she's a much better heart rate monitor. Now, how's this something for different? No evidence. Not a little bit, not like a smidge, no evidence of a specific heart rate for optimal performance. Some candidates and most officers, so again, guys in the academy struggle once they're out in the field. Most officers did not lose finding complex motor skills at elevated stress levels as indicated by heart rate. It just did not happen. What she saw, we tended to see, were spikes in heart rate, and they were very, very short-term spikes like the heart rate spikes for a second or two and comes right back down. Uh, most of us are familiar with like a loud motorcycle or something like that when somebody blips the throttle, it goes up really, really fast and then it comes right back, back down. What she saw was that as things got more stressful, 
the spikes would come up and come down and they would get more frequent. But the heart rate never really, really galloped out of control. Interestingly enough, this thing called task complexity, which we'll talk more about later, was of major importance in predicting success. Other findings. Overall, those who did have lower heart rate curves and had fewer heart rate spikes performed better. If you did have a steeper heart rate curve and more spikes, it indicated your performance was worse, but it didn't guarantee failure. If you were in a knockdown drag out fight with somebody, you might still end up with the handcuffs on. They might not have been pretty handcuff application as far as that go. Interestingly enough, very few, but some people crash during even low stress events. Tells me that guys, here's the ugly truth as we, we move into 2022. Some people are meant to call 911 and some people, a lot fewer, are meant to be 911. And when you mix up the two, it makes a great big steaming mess. Interestingly enough, once physical exertion was, a was involved, the level of fitness on the officer's part hugely affected the stress levels that were seen. And again, not shocking if you've done the job for a bit, street experience trumped almost everything when it came to predicting success. Now, Murray quotes, and this is what drives me crazy. Vonk published this very early 2000s. Murray directly references her in 2004, right? That was a long time ago. But with very few, who's heard of Vonk's research that completely debunked this stuff? It was published in like 2001. And like it doesn't really updates their maps, right? Uh, quoting Murray, the brain is the actual causal factor based on the threat perceived and the heart rate serves as a barometer or a window to an individual uh, stress level. The heart rate adjusts instantly to the perceived need for high energy output. The presence and frequency of heart rate spike, however, would most likely be a, would most likely vary depending on the level of skill and confidence that a person has in a particular situation. It comes down to this. This is a chicken and egg argument. For years, we were told that the cause was the heart rate going up, and that's just simply not the case. The heart rate tells you how much energy expenditure the brain thinks is necessary, okay? The brain is still in control, but it's automatically getting the engine up ready to go in case it's needed, right? Now, some serious implications on that stuff. Again, we're back to the subjective impressions of the officers. If the officers think they're in control, what? They tend to stay in control. Now, specifically, their perception that they could handle the problem at hand. So imagine I'm standing in this room and y'all aren't here. As I'm standing here in the corner, I look up and a polar bear wanders through the door. Do I have a problem? Yes. To a polar bear, what am I? I'm just a slow moving sack of protein. If I look at the polar bear and go, oh my God, I'm gonna die. What's likely to happen? Die. I'm gonna be bear shit. Now, there is a very small select part of the world that will look at that polar bear and go, he's gonna look good in front of my fireplace. Are there people like that? Yeah, there are a few. Now, what can we reasonably hope for? Oh shit, I have a problem, but I can solve it, right? Three completely different responses to what? The exact same stimuli. So it's that perception that they can handle the problem that made all the difference. Uh, interestingly enough, the presence of a partner was only positive when the officers believed they were paired with a competent partner. Imagine that, but a difference. Who here has ever worked with a bad partner? You're like, oh God, you know, just don't, just don't send them. You know, I'll be better off, right? Uh, and again, we see again, the physical conditioning tended to really limit the amount of the heart rate spikes. So based on this, does anybody still believe all this heart rate crap we've been sold for years? I mean, it's just demonstrably not true. You know, what do we call stuff that's not true? Lies.